Bible, I want to invite you to turn in it to Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 to 24. If you're using a pew Bible, you'll find that on page 401, 401. We're dealing with current issues in this series in which we find ourselves. Today, we are talking about justice. We're trying to understand justice. And justice is a hot-button topic today, uh, especially in America, for a few reasons. I think one is because smartphones uh, have put local happenings all over the world right at our fingertips. And uh, what news travels fast, if not controversial news, right? So we see these kind of things. Also, the fact that we're a country that has really a past of racial tension. Um, And that's not uncommon. I mean, different countries have pasts of tension between people groups. Uh, But we've got our own, and we feel it pretty keenly. And so, therefore, uh, we are constantly thinking about, is this just? Is this not just? Is this fair or not fair? Uh, whatever it is. And so we're constantly thinking about that. And so what I want to do today, I'm not giving you a full sermon on justice, but we're talking about the foundation for justice that Christians should build their understanding on. And we're using this verse, these two verses, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 to 24, to start ourselves off here. So thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment or justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. Now, Jeremiah here, the Old Testament prophet, the weeping prophet, people called him. I've heard some manly preachers before make fun of Jeremiah being a a man of of sorrow and a man of uh, of weeping. And I'm like, well, Jesus was called a man of sorrows and he wept as well. So I think that there's, that's a manly thing sometimes. Um, Jeremiah here, he he is contrasting two types of glorying. You see the word glory there in verses 23 and 24. Glory is literally the Hebrew word hallel. And it's the word from which we get the word hallelujah. And it literally means to shine or to glow. That's what the word means. And so it means something more than just like literally shining or something like that. Uh, But you get the idea here that it means something like enjoying, something like boasting. in. so so that's why it's translated as glorying. Um, Here, this is two, it's contrasting two types of glorying, worldly glorying with godly glorying. Verse 23 is worldly glorying. People in the world, they glory in this way. If they're wise, they glory in their wisdom. That is to say, how smart, how educated, how learned, how sage they are, perhaps. They really find their identity in their wisdom if they're wise. If they're mighty, they, uh, they glory in their might. How powerful, how strong, maybe how many people that they have in their group or something like that. Um, they really glory in this. This is their whole identity and where they find their joy. And finally here, he says that the rich, they often glory in their riches. This is what wealthy societies do, what successful people do who have a lot of money. This is really where they find their joy and their happiness uh, in this life. And to do so is actually, it might be hard to kind of get your mind around this, it's actually functionally atheistic. Because to glory in these things as though you have accomplished these things on your own is to ignore the fact that there were all kinds of other variables that were involved in your getting rich or getting wise or something like that. And therefore, God had to be involved in this. I always laugh because, you know, I'm a big sports guy, and I see all these commercials all the time where people say it's all about hard work and determination and getting in the gym and all of that, and that's how you will guarantee yourself a place at the big boys table. And I'm like, yeah, but what if you're like five foot ten, and you're a basketball player? It's really hard to get to the NBA at five foot ten, regardless of how many hours you spend in the gym, especially these days. There are other factors that are in play in all of this. It's functionally atheistic to glory in you're having accomplished these things as though you were the one who did it all on your own. And we all have a temptation to do this. This this disease is in us, but that's worldly glorying. Verse 24 shows us godly glorying. What is it? 
Let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That is to say, understands, he understands conceptually that there is a God. He's distinct from his creation, but he's involved with his creation, so he understands, and he knows me personally. That's the idea here. Not only that there's a God, but this person is in a relationship with God. That's the true ground for true glorying, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness. And as you know, that's my favorite Hebrew word in the Hebrew, chesed, or chesed. I gotta get the, gotta get the nasal thing going on there. It's the word that literally refers to that transformational covenant love that God has for people that changes their lives. That I practice that love, judgment or justice, that is to say, fairness in disciplines and in judgments, that I'm a fair God and that I make sure that my people are a fair people as well. And that I'm the God who practices righteousness, that is to say, I shepherd my people in godliness and I demand Demand that they grow in godliness and righteousness. If you're going to boast, boast in knowing me that I am the God who saves people, redeems them, and disciples them. So wrong boasting is to say all the blessings that I have in life, I got them myself. And I'm going to find my meaning in these things and my purpose in these things. Right boasting is there is a God. He's revealed himself. He cares about me. He loves me. He provides for me. He blesses me. He gives me meaning and purpose in life. And I'm going to build my life on what he has revealed to me about himself. That is to say, as the psalmist prays in Psalm 119, verse 68, that God is good and he does good. That becomes your glory if you are a godly person. I guess we could also argue that this is happiness in the world versus happiness in the Lord. Verse 23 shows us happiness in the world and the world's things. Verse 24, happiness in the Lord. Here's the problem. If your happiness is in the world, if you lose any of these things, what happens to your happiness? You lose that too. You're going to be depressed. You're going to be anxious. You're going to be upset. You're going to be angry. All of that. But if your happiness is in the Lord, because the Lord is safe and he's in eternity and the things of the world don't affect him really the same way that they affect us, Your mind can be tranquil, and you can have life in peace. And so there's nothing that can take that from you. People can take take your riches. People can even take your wisdom over the course of time. As the years go by, we lose our faculties eventually. Usually, we're going to lose all of these things. But you can't lose the Lord if you have the Lord, because he's eternal and because he's sovereign and in control. So Jeremiah is contrasting fleeting worldly wisdom with eternal wisdom godly wisdom that depends on him and that is truly life-giving. You might be sitting here saying, okay, we get it, pastor. You're supposed to be preaching on justice today, though. What does this have to do with justice, other than the fact that God says the word judgment, and there's a text note that says it could be justice in the Hebrew there in verse 24. What does this have to do with justice? Because again, the world is clamoring today for justice. You hear it all the time. People talk about social justice. They talk about how we've got to make sure that there's justice here and there. And it's natural for us to do this because he's a God of justice and we're created in his image. We should want justice. We should want fairness, all of that. But I suggest to you that the fact that we do such a poor job at accepting outcomes and we are constantly angry all the time, regardless of how much justice does occur, suggests that there's something deeply wrong with us. Um, And here's what it is. I think that people are world-focused and not God-focused. I think that the reason why there is such a backwards and even sideways focus on a lack of justice today is because people are so focused just like last week, right? Those of, you, those of you who were here, is because people today are so focused on the things of the world, verse 23, and not focused on God and the things of the Lord, verse 24. Um, and I'm not saying that there are no legitimate cases of 
of no justice. I'm not saying that there aren't legitimate cases where we need to be concerned that justice is practiced and it's not being practiced in certain places. I'm just saying that I think that it's a lot fewer and further between than the American media suggests that it is. I think people are angry because, they're, because our affections are too tied to the things of this world because we find our glory in the things of this world and not in the things of the Lord and in the Lord himself. Many people actually don't want justice in the world. They actually want revenge. And those are two different things. I heard somebody say one time that justice is about harmony. Revenge is about making yourself feel better. Actually, I would tweak that a little bit. <clears throat> justice is about fairness for the sake of harmony, whereas revenge is about making yourself feel better. And it seems like People are not interested today in harmony. They don't want that. They don't want real fairness. They want revenge because, because of past things and past events hurting them, things being taken from them uh, because they are attaching too much meaning to the things of this life. You're seeing this all the time today with, with people groups talking about how it's unfair that I don't have the same opportunities that other people have. Um, or that I, was, that I was raised in a certain type of society that's different than the ones that have more than I do. And instead of acknowledging that there's just, that, that it's, people are born into different circumstances at different socioeconomic levels and all of that, and just we can't really control these things, everything is an inequity. Everything is an inequality today, is what they're saying. And and it's because what people want are things in the world that they can boast in and find their happiness and their joy in. What's driving it? Very simply, pride is what's driving it. Instead of, uh, instead of an attitude of humility that says, whatever God gives me, that's what I have. And I can try to make things better. Maybe the Lord puts that on my heart. No, that's not what people want. There's this... There's this sense, they're calling it justice, that is, really, that is really focused on trying to get more in this life so that I can be more comfortable in this life. It's driven by pride. But the truth that Jeremiah is telling us about is that if we start with God, if we start with him, we get all three of these things that God talks about. Loving kindness, that kind of transformational love that God offers us. We get justice. That is to say that God is going to make sure that fairness happens for us, even if not in every single circumstance. And nevertheless, we're going to be able to make peace with what happens. And we're going to also find righteousness. Again, he's going to shepherd us and lead us, make us a righteous, just, and fair people. And so, again, the point here is that Jeremiah is saying that if you boast in the things of this life, if you lose it, you're going to lose your boasting, lose your happiness, and be upset. But if you boast in the Lord and you seek him, not only do you have that eternally, but it changes your life. And it, and it is really the actual well of happiness in this life. And that just does not seem to be the message that a lot of evangelical Christians are sharing with the world today. Seems like a lot of, in a lot of ways we're taken in with uh, some of these narratives out in the world instead of saying, no, 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 what people need before anything else is the Lord. Unless we start with him, justice is always going to be in danger. It's always going to be in danger of not actually occurring if our affections are set on the things of this life. We're always going to be upset if we don't start with God. But if we start with him, he has the ability to set the table for us and to establish and enact justice in his creation. You might know Psalm 89, 14 that says that righteousness and justice are the pillars of God's throne. That's why Abraham, in that text that we looked at last, well, before that text that we looked at last week, when he's praying for Sodom, uh, he says, shall not the judge of the whole earth judge rightly? This is a just and fair God. There is no injustice. There is no darkness. There is no unfairness with him. 
in the least. And this is why also on a Wednesday night, if you were there at prayer meeting, we were just looking at the story of the daughters of Zelophehad. How's that for a name? Uh, a lot of Old Testament names are used to name kids these days. Uh, we've, got, we've got one of them. But I, I've never heard anybody name their child Zelophehad. But anyway, anyway, Zelophehad, this is in, a, it's in Numbers 27. The story is that Zelophehad dies. He doesn't have any sons. He's just got a bunch of daughters. And the system in Israel is not set up for daughters to be able to get the inheritance. Um, it should be set up that way, and, and eventually it would be. Uh, but at the time, it's not revealed yet. And so the daughters, they come to Moses and they say, you know, we really probably should get that inheritance because there's nobody else for it to go to. So will you go inquire of the Lord for us? You remember what Moses does. He goes and inquires of the Lord, and God, in something that might, might be a little startling to us, responds by saying, they're right. They're correct. They should get their inheritance. And so he rewards them because they started with him and they assumed that he was a God of justice and a God of fairness, a God of righteousness. Um, they didn't sulk and moan and groan that something was happening to them that might not be fair. They sought the Lord, and the Lord rewarded this. And this should be, this should be the absolute pursuit that believers have and that we should be driving people to seek uh, the Lord for. If you don't start with the Lord, there are going to be two types of justice that actually are, are pretty related to each other, uh, but they're a little bit different from each other. Two types of justice that are going to reign supreme in the world if we don't start with the Lord. And actually, what they have in common is they both can be described as might makes right. That's a phrase I use with my eighth grade students uh, at the school. Might makes right. That is to say... Um, Whoever is the most powerful and has the loudest voice is the one who decides what's right. And so one version of this, if we don't start with the Lord, of might makes right, is might makes right be a pure democracy. That is to say, whoever has the, the highest numbers on any side of an argument, they're the ones who decide what's right. And um, you can see the problems with this, right? Because the majority, I don't know if you know this or not, can sometimes be wrong. It's happened a lot over the course of world history that the majority was wrong. But if you don't start with the Lord, it might lead to that. On the other hand, if you, if you go the opposite way, you might fall in with might makes right via, and I wrote down monarchy here on my notes. That might not be the right word, but we might say might makes right via dictatorship. That is to say, one individual person decides what's right and everybody else has to go along with it. And I don't think I have to get you thinking too much today about all the problems with that. But in both cases, you are, you are hitching your hope wagon to a worldview that says fallen people can decide on their own what's right, or a fallen individual can decide on his or her own what's right. And yet everything is, like, there's going to be so many problems that come from this. And humanity is, seems to be so complicated in how we relate to each other. How can this be? Like, how can these things actually work rightly? Study world history. They don't. Dictators can't rule well. Pure democracies actually don't work well either. Everybody ends up in, in trouble and in problems and all of that. The Bible is much, much more precise in how it says that we're supposed to approach the world created by God, a God of justice, and enact justice in his world. First, this is the first thing, and maybe even the most important thing for what we're talking about. Everybody is created in God's image, and therefore everybody has equal dignity regardless of their socioeconomic background. Everybody's equal. And this flattens the playing field, doesn't it? It levels it. I've heard people say before in the past that total depravity levels the playing field. It does. Everybody's sinful. Everybody's wicked. Everybody needs Jesus. Nobody's better than anybody else. This does the same thing. Nobody's better than anybody else. And by the way, this was instrumental in the abolishment of slavery in the West, was this idea being pressed down on the consciences of people over the course of the centuries. Everybody's equal. Everybody's created in God's image. Secondly, because God is a God of justice and because God wants 
harmony, and that's what justice is about, fairness for the sake of harmony. Therefore, justice is necessary in God's creation. And so everybody's created in his his image, and God wants there to be harmony in our midst. But then thirdly here, the effects of the fall. Because we're fallen people, all kinds of injustices and mistreatment are going to riddle our existence from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, and from the beginning of history to the end of it. And furthermore, as a result of the fall, folly is bound up within our hearts such that we have blind spots, we've got biases. And so whereas he created us to be a people who can think clearly and who can govern his creation because of the nature of the fall, we don't do this. We have all kinds of misunderstandings and things like that. So we've got a problem here in our midst. But this leads us to the fifth point that the scripture makes about what we need to deal with first. And that is that Christ, the Son of God, comes into the world to save us by grace, such that therefore we're a gracious people. He makes us a gracious people who are patient, compassionate, all of that like he is. But then he sets our eyes heavenward, saying that that is where our reward and our inheritance is, and not in the things of this life. And so the point, I guess, the point here is that since our problem stems from setting our eyes on the things of this world, and that's why we can't have justice, Christ comes into the world to set our minds on the Lord, and that becomes the foundation for us to find justice and for us to see it enacted in the world. That's why he's king, Scripture says, the king of kings and lord of lords who wants to influence societies toward godliness as the days go by and more and more as the years go by. This is what we as Christians should be working toward, is godly influence in society. We should be a people who are trying to participate Uh, socially as much as we possibly can without losing our responsibility to make disciples, but do so for the sake of godly influence in society. Because in this way, the king of kings gets more and more acknowledged as king of kings. And this is the only hope for justice that the world has. Otherwise, we're just going to constantly be in this, to quote from an old Coldplay song, this battle from beginning to end, this cycle of recycled revenge, uh, death and all of his friends. We're just going to constantly be going back and forth, angry with each other uh, because everybody else gets justice, but I don't. Really, it's that really it's that we live in a fallen world. Things are complicated. And what we need is to set our eyes above where the Lord is. The type of justice that's being advocated today And like I said, this is not really a full sermon on the nature of justice in Scripture. What I'm more trying to tackle in this series is things that I think that you're thinking about and having to wrestle through often. And what I'm tackling today is the type of justice that's being talked about all over the place. I'm arguing it's not scriptural justice. It's definitely not justice that starts with God. And therefore, since it doesn't start with God, it's oftentimes not justice, it's revenge. Because because it's being pushed for by a people, probably ourselves included, who have a natural propensity to elevate and idolize the things of this life instead of the Lord himself. So the type of justice advocated today is not God's because actually it ends up creating more injustice. Have you ever noticed that? As people are pushing for justice and fairness and fairness and all of that, it ends up always just creating more bitterness and more resentment between people groups. That's because we don't know how to work justice ourselves. It ends up just being a battle. It ends up being exactly the very thing perhaps that Marx was talking about when he was talking about the class struggle. Actually, He was on to something when he said that there is this struggle. There is this battle going on between people groups all the time. And it's been that way ever since the beginning. Justice isn't isn't happening uh, because what people mean by justice is not what God does. 
But if we begin with him, fairness is understood within the context of eternity and our relationship with God, not within the context of the world and the things of the world. This isn't really like too deep today. I know that. At least I don't think that it is. I think it's fairly simple. But we would do well to ask the Lord to, through his spirit, help us to keep our minds above. Because that's, that's what it means to be a Christian. Before anything else, it is to have your eyes on Jesus. And where is Jesus? He's at the Father's right hand right now, preparing a place for us, promising to return again, to, to judge and to make it all a new creation. The only way that we get there is if we are boasting in the Lord, not in the things of this life. And therefore, how we think about justice is going to be different than how the world does. It's interesting. <clears throat> what, you, what you're hearing today all the time uh, by the sort of zeitgeist, the spirit of the age today, is that we, we need to move on from the oppressive ways of the past into the liberating ways of the future. And what that is, that's a progressive view of history that oversimplifies history, revises it, changes it to mean something different than it actually, than it actually was when it happened, and makes an enemy of things actually that were liberating in the past. What's one example? Again, as I've said, it's the influence of the Christian gospel over the world that has led to all the incredible liberties that people in the West experience today. But if you were to ask multitudes today, they would say, no, 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 it's the Christian gospel that has oppressed us and held us down. We need to throw all those things off and run headfirst into a liberty that we are going to define ourselves. What I'm saying is that you don't realize that what you're doing is you're cutting yourself off from the one who is the only source of justice that the world has. And believers have to do a better job of being clear on these things, clear-headed on these things. Christ, as King of kings, Lord of lords, and as the word who became flesh, and as the one who brings his new creation into his old creation, if ever there's anything good that has happened, it's because it came from him. If ever there's anything bad that happens, we'll take credit for that. That's our doing. We're sinners. And so we, we've got to be clear that what we don't need is to cut ourselves off from the God who is a God of justice and righteousness. If we do that, things are just going to get worse and worse and worse. So I guess what I'm trying to say to you today, <clears throat> I've said a lot of things, but what I'm trying to say to you today is that people need God first before anything else. And without having him, justice and harmony from justice is going to be elusive. We're never going to get there. We're never going to experience it. If you don't start with the Lord and you have your attention and your affections focused on the things of this life, it's based on a lie. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier. I think I meant to, but I might have bypassed it. When King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he, uh, he stands in Daniel 4. He looks out over Babylon, and he says, look at this great kingdom that I have built. You remember what, God's, what God does. He says, well, I'm going to show this guy a lesson, because this isn't something that the king did. This is something that I have given to you, king. And over the course of time, he learns his hard lesson, and eventually he's converted, and he says, you know what? I've been proud, and God has humbled me. You know what he was doing? He was boasting in the things of this life, and he was living a lie. And then after he came to the truth, and his reason returned to him, it says at the end of Daniel 4, then he becomes a godly man, and one who, through whom God can work. This is exactly the kind of thing um, that we're talking about. Without the Lord, there is no justice. There is no potential of harmony. Whenever we see acts of justice in the world, we should, we should celebrate it, shouldn't we? We should be happy whenever it does happen. All I'm saying is that we should say the source of where it came from 
and that's that God has been good and God has been kind in our midst. So let me give you, let me just give you here in closing three, um, three pictures of the world's justice versus God's justice. Um, because I've not been offensive enough this morning yet, um, I, uh, I want to talk about some actual things in the news and, um, and see, uh, see if I can make you even more mad. Um, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, but, uh, but this, is, this is difficult. I mean, these, these things that are happening, it's really hard to talk about because, you know, we get emotionally invested in these stories, we develop an opinion, we're afraid to share it because we don't want to be grouped in with a certain people group or something like that. But I just want to give you three pictures of the world's justice versus God's justice uh, as you've doubtless experienced it over the last few years. The first one would be the death of George Floyd. Um, you know the story. Here's a man who uh, was in an altercation with police officers. Um, they're trying to arrest him. He resists. It turns into this insane struggle where they're going back and forth, and eventually the cop puts his knee on the neck of this man for, I think, nine minutes, nine and a half minutes, something like that, and, uh, and he dies. And this cop uh, is tried. It's, I believe, it's second and third degree murder, uh, second, second and third degree murder, and then involuntary manslaughter. I believe those are the three charges. And, uh, and when we look at a situation like this, total just negligence from the officer, um, an appropriate response, a godly response to this would be to say, yes, there needs to be justice here. This was, this was a type of murder that happened here. Definitely negligence and, and a type of murder. There's got to be a call for justice here. There's got to be trial. There's got to be sentencing. Maybe even the death penalty. I'm not sure. But I will say this. People think that you can't be pro-life and pro-death penalty. And I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. Because when Noah came off the ark, you remember what God said to him. If you shed man's blood, by man shall your blood be shed. And I think God is saying there, we have to value life high enough that if somebody takes life, there's got to be a punishment for it. That's valuing life highly. And so I'm not saying that that's the thing that should be practiced here with the officer who killed George Floyd. I'm just saying that this is something that we have to think about and wrestle through this and then commit it to the Lord and ask him to work through the sentencing and all of this. Um, what's an inappropriate response to these kinds of things that are to, to this exact thing? Rioting, looting, destroying businesses, many of which are minority owned by people who have had a lot of challenges to being successful in this country. And I want to be careful how I say this next part because I don't want to disrespect the dead. But almost making a saint out of somebody who, quite frankly, was far from a saint. Um, and, and that's all I want to say about that. This is dangerous what we're doing here. <laughs> this is, it's dangerous how we're responding to these kinds of things. But if you don't start with the Lord, this is the kind of thing that's going to happen. Another example, another picture of this. This one's much more recent. You know this story of this uh, little girl in Ohio uh, who, was, uh, who was raped by a 27-year-old. This girl was nine years old, they're saying. And the, the details have come out more and more as the last uh, week has gone along. And uh, just a, a horrendous story where she ends up uh, impregnated. I didn't even know this was possible at that, at that age. It's a little... A little weird, a little strange, but it seems to be seems to be true. Not really sure of all the details and all of that. But people respond to this in light of what has happened with the Dobbs decision um, over the last few weeks, and they say what needs to happen here is the, is justice. There needs to be a termination of the pregnancy, and the guy needs to be put in jail. And I'm like, I'm not really sure if that's how we should approach this. A godly response would be to say, sometimes in mysterious ways, what one person means for evil can actually be a vessel through which God can bring about some good, i.e., a child, a baby. What needs to happen is, if we are going to approach this from a theologically sound perspective where God is the author of life, 
this baby should be born, and either the family keeps it or gives it to adoption to a couple who can't have babies because there are so many of them. And it's insane to me how hard it is to adopt uh, these, these days. And then the guy who committed this crime should have to pay child support for the entire duration of the baby's childhood, either from in jail or from out of jail. But you see what we're doing here? We're starting with, we're starting with a theological basis uh, in approaching, again, very difficult issues. But we're starting with a theological basis first. And this third picture here, um, this is my favorite one to talk about. It was a story from a few years ago with uh, Botham Jean. Maybe you remember this story. He was a, a black man who was in uh, his apartment. This is, I think, 2019, uh, in his apartment. And uh, this police officer, this white woman, comes home. And apparently she, police officer, though she be with her, uh, with, with her training to just kind of have her eyes peeled all the time, apparently somehow or another goes into the wrong apartment and she thinks that he's an intruder. Really, she's in his apartment, and she mows him down and, uh, and shoots him. And it's this big thing uh, that's happening where everybody's saying that there's got to be justice, there's got to be fairness, there's got to be this and that and this and that. We all look at this, and we're like, yeah, total, again, negligence, uh, murder. And that was, her, that was her charge. There's something that happened in this trial, and maybe you remember this. Botham's brother, his name's Brant, he gets, up, uh, he gets up to witness, not to witness, but to give testimony. Sometimes, I guess that's a part of the process is the family members get up and give a testimony. He gets up, and he's on the witness stand. Again, he's 19 years old, this young man. And he sits up there, and he looks at the police officer, and he says, I forgive you. I actually don't even want you to go to jail. I want what's best for you, and what's best for you is to give your life to Christ. That's the most important thing that you could ever have, is to give your life to Christ. That's absolutely what's best for you. And he sits up here for like two minutes, and he just gives the gospel to the nation, basically. And he asks the judge, can I, can I step down there and give her, give her a hug? And it's this tear fest that happens, that happens there in the courtroom, and then as I'm sitting here in my office watching it, uh, every time I've watched it, what, what's happening with what he did, um, what he said to her, this young man who is just a king in my eyes, he assumes that Christ is going to deal with her heart rightly, and he's going to lead her into justice and righteousness, exactly like God says that he will. I'm not saying that like we should get rid of the court system and replace it with calls to regeneration, to being born again. God says very, very clearly that those in positions of power are there to punish evil and to reward good. And we can't force regeneration. We know this. We can't. He can preach the gospel to this officer. That doesn't mean that she's going to come to faith. But what I am saying is this. This young man had an upward view. He had his eyes focused on Christ who is in heaven, and before anything else, he said, I want to turn your eyes there as well. I would venture to say that is a truly Christian perspective. If we would be Christians, that's the first thing that we take as priority, is to turn people's attention to the risen Christ, who has the ability to put this godly, loving kindness, justice, and righteousness into our hearts. Only he can. This is, by the way, the reason why, if you look in your uh, Bible there, if it has cross-references, you'll see that verse 24 um, is quoted in 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, when Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 1, he says, Christ has become to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That is to say, Christ is the entirety of our salvation. He and he alone, he's all of it. And then he says, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul quotes this because he is saying that Jesus is the one who can get this into us. And that's why if you've not come to Christ, you need to. 
because God is a just God, a loving God, a righteous God, and he wants you to image that. And you'll only find happiness if you do. And that's what Jesus came into the world to do, is to give that to us so that we will boast in him and not in the things of this life and truly be a just people. So what's the Christian's responsibility here? Oh, I thought I was going to be done early. Actually, I'm going to be done late. What's the Christian's responsibility? Responsibility. Let me just give you two quick thoughts here to end. First, it's to make disciples and to disciple them. Before anything else, our responsibility before social issues and even before working for justice in this world, which should be a priority, our first responsibility is to be an embassy of the kingdom of God, to preach Christ, to make disciples, and then to disciple them. I read a story a few years ago in a magazine from a Chinese Christian who, again, you know Christianity is outlawed in China. It's a communist country, but there are some people who think that China is going to be majority Christian in the next 20, 25 years. (laughs) They try to stop the gospel, and they simply can't. This is why Christians should be so much more positive about the state of the world. The gospel is more global than it's ever been. It's remarkable. But anyway, I digress. This a guy in this magazine, um, he's asked why he's become a Christian. He said, if everybody in China became a Christian, jails would be empty and the streets would be clean. You know what he's saying? If everybody embraced Jesus, they would become just people. That's why we've got a disciple. Make disciples and disciple them. And then secondly, and finally here, in closing, the Christian's responsibility is to learn what God says is just and what God says is justice, not what the world says and not what we say. We're too biased to figure this out on our own. We've got too many blind spots. So does the world. We've got to choose the good portion, just like Mary did, and sit at Jesus' feet and let him teach us guide us and shepherd us. Boast in him and boast in him alone. And he promises that he will make us the people that he created us to be. That's the only hope that the world has. That's what Brant Jean believed as he sat up there on the witness stand and preached the gospel to this young woman, this cop, and also to the, to the rest of the world, everybody else who was watching. He believed what you need more than anything is to give your life to Christ, who can make us what we're supposed to be. And let the people of God always share that perspective as well. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, today, simply we acknowledge that we need Christ. And we're thankful that he's there for us. Teach us, O Lord, we pray, to be just people. Teach us to stand for what you say is true justice. Teach us to treat everybody with equal dignity, to stand for what's right, but to first and foremost be an embassy of the kingdom of God, turning people's attention to the one who is the king of kings and lord of lords. And we pray all this in Christ's righteous and matchless name. Amen.